Welcome everyone. Uh, it's Tuesday night again. I'm Jackie Lewis. I am the clinical nutritionist at BN Multi. And each week we meet here on the page to talk about lots of different things related to bariatric surgery, nutrition, recovery, uh, weight loss, regain, weird things our bodies do after surgery. Uh, this week we're talking about carbs versus calories um, and what to think and do about that. Um, and we're also running through last week's poll, which was on carbs and calories. And uh, we are also going to have a look at the Transformation Tuesday um, winners. And we'll also, within that, introduce our new range of shapewear. So that way you can exercise freely and energetically without feeling things moving all over the place. <laughs> So um, I hope you've got your cup of tea ready. Can you believe we have 13 million people out of 26 at home at the moment? Um, so all I can really say is I hope you stay well. I hope you stay safe. And I hope you're taking your BN Multi because that's a huge part of looking after your nutritional health and your immune wealth after weight loss surgery a lot of the nutrition um, or the nutrients that you do run low after surgery or you have an impact on their absorption of um, will help to support your immunity so um, if you're adding a little bit of stress a little bit of um, you know anticipation you'll also be using those nutrients in um, higher demand so take care eat well stay warm this week it's freezing. I think we're even in Queensland, we're down to about five or six degrees at night time. <laughs> so it's all happening. Might as well be at home if you ask me if it's going to be less than 20 degrees. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Please post your questions in the group each week so we can keep um, coming up with relevant content that you want to listen to. Uh, keep an eye on the podcast. This week uh, we're re visiting one from Amber Kay on mindset and managing regain after weight loss surgery and the mindset that that kind of thing takes as well. So don't miss that. And don't miss our newsletter tomorrow where the blog that comes out um, every second Wednesday um, is on carbohydrates and calories. So you'll get to know more about that. Good on you guys, the ones who've been participating in this month's um, squat challenge i've been pretty impressed to see how many of you are doing all your squats and then adding on a walk and you know it does start a cascade of activity once you do start moving so good work um i'll just share the screen um i'll just share the screen <clears throat> uh this one so we can show you last week's poll results. I'll just zoom it in a little bit. Someone was asking about that the other day. I think that might be visible still. So um, <clears throat> carbs and calories, how much should you be having? Who knows? Um, I'll talk about the difference between counting carbs and counting calories soon. 45 votes. Um, People said, I know there are good and bad carbs. I'm not sure which ones and how to count, how it counts to my calories. Um, this is a good sign that we know there's something there, but we just need to learn a little bit more about it. 35 votes knows a fair bit and check out the labels before buying. Good stuff. And it, it the labels on the back of the food packets will definitely reveal a lot of things if you know what you're looking for. Um, 32 votes said they have a fair idea, but not 100% confident with checking carbs and calories. 11 votes have no idea between carbs and calories. So I hope you are the 11 people who are watching. <laughs> Five votes. I know the difference between carbs and calories Try to keep myself safe and maintain my weight. And four said, I know the difference, but not how much I should have of each and have never been a counter of anything, which is interesting and not such a bad thing. And I'll go into that later so um i know there are good and bad carbs and that's a good thing to know um we call them 
uh, simple carbs and complex carbs. And the reason I do that is because I try to make sure we're not um, having too many negatives around our understanding or our attitude towards food. Um, because nothing's bad until you have too much of it or not enough of it, <laughs> or um, you have it in the wrong combination, perhaps. So complex carbs are the ones you'd like to think are taking up most of the carbohydrate intake in your food. And they're things like whole grains, um, you know, nothing refined. So not white flour, you're having brown flour. If you're having anything, um, you're looking at foods that are harder to break down. So a simple carb, which tells you that it's not that hard, is a, um, it's generally a sugar or a starch that are quite quick to release their energy. Um, so things like, of course, sugar, anything with O's on the back of the labels that you're looking at, um, are a sugar so fructose galactose um, sucrose glucose those sorts of things are all just different forms of sugar so fructose obviously comes from fruit so it's not a bad thing it's just a quick hit of energy in a lot of ways so please don't call them bad carbs just call them sometimes carbs because sometimes you can have them and you know you're not going to throw things out too badly if you balance your, if you are too heavy in the simple carbs, what the problem with that is, is that you have then um, the response to eating those simple carbohydrates like um, white pasta, white bread, lollies, Coke, those sorts of things. The way the body manages that influx of um, blood glucose is to spray out insulin as a result and that is the hormone that levels our blood glucose levels um, and it's responsible for um, letting um, energy into the cells so it's a good thing to have too much of it is not a good thing so when you're eating these simple sugars um, and these refined carbohydrates in large amounts and on a regular basis your body is releasing lots and lots of insulin and one response it has to that is to become insulin resistant which is the precursor to diabetes type, type 2 diabetes so when you're kind of drowning your tissues in this insulin on a regular basis the body's response is whoa this is too much insulin um, so I'll just shut down my cells for a little bit so we just don't take on the insulin. What that means is that you then have a real um, problem with um, fat burning. So you have a problem losing weight and you have a problem with um, the transformation of fat into energy. So I'm not selling you insulin, am I? So um, that those are the foods that will um, set off that cascade and send you down the path to a, um, that type 2 diabetic kind of insulin-resistant um, path. Um, some other hormonal conditions like polycystic ovarian syndrome and a few other of those endocrine disorders will also come with some insulin resistance. Um, so cracking the code for that is... Um, a big part of bringing down body weight and um, rebalancing all those hormones as well. So good carbs are good. <laughs> they come in the form of fruit and veggies and complex carbs like um, whole grain breads, seedy breads, those sorts of things that are um, uh, slower burning packets of energy rather than quick hits like a can of Coke would be, if that makes sense. Um, Reading the labels on your food is going to give you a good insight into your what form of carbohydrate is in the food. It might have it might be a packet of biscuits. I'm just going to give you this as an example. You might have a packet of Rivita in one hand and a packet of Tim Tams in the other on any given day of the week. And you might look at the back of the packet and have a look at the carbohydrate content of those foods. And one will have, the Rivita, of course, will have carbs in it, not a bad thing. You need those to function. You need those to help your brain function for cognition. You need to, your, your brain basically um, 
runs on glucose. So if you cut your carbs out totally, that's why people get cranky and um, forgetful and um, upset. And sometimes it's just emotional. Um, so if you've got the Rivita and you've got the box of Tim Tams, the Rivita will have carbohydrate in it, but it won't have um, sugars, whereas the it won't have much in the way of sugars whereas the Tim Tams will have perhaps the same amount of carbohydrates, but then you'll see that 90% of it is coming from sugar. So you could look at the Tim Tam and know that there's not much rye <laughs> or complex whole grain goodness in the Tim Tam, and you can guarantee that the, the carbohydrates are just straight sugars coming from chocolate and creamy stuff and biscuity bits in the middle, whereas you know that the Rivita, being what it is, is good solid rye-based carbohydrate, which is a slow burn. Um, so they might have a similar carbohydrate total, but they'll have a different um, number under the sugar component. So that's how you know what's added as well. If you've got a product that's um, got X amount of carbohydrates in it and then it has um, a bunch of sugar, you know something's gone on with that food that they've added it. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like we need to have a look at building our confidence in understanding how many carbs we should be experimenting with. Um, too low in carbs. I had a good question the other day about... Um, weight loss surgery patients following a keto diet, which is a high fat, low carb protein diet. And whilst ketogenesis is a good state to be in, if you're looking at fat loss, the research is showing that over the longer term, sticking to that kind of um, balance of calories from high fat, high protein, low carb is actually not as effective as having more carbohydrates good carbs in the diet um, for long-term weight loss. So I refer to the ketogenic diet as a therapeutic diet, which I feel should be applied for a period of time and then phased out. And you can phase it in, phase it out, but it should be done under supervision um, because <laughs> I think also a diet that's high in fat, I looked at what I would need to do to follow a ketogenic diet and I'd need about 150 grams of fat every day and a whole stack of protein. It just doesn't sit well with me that you're not eating much fiber. Um, and for a digestive system that exists um, such as a bariatric patient's tummy, I think we just need um, to make sure we're getting enough fruit and veggies and plants and um, nutrients as much as we can from um, the food that we eat. And a ketogenic diet will often be really kind of meat-based and um, protein-rich, which we do need, but also um, pretty low in the veggie, in veggies and that sort of stuff if you're eating that much fat. So um, how do we manage all of this? What do we do with carbs? Do we count carbs or do we count calories or do we not count? What do we do? Um, initially, the bariatric diet when we first start the journey needs to be quite measured so counting is also an educational tool um, counting the amount of carbs you eat you have a protein goal that you're trying to meet you have a border goal you're also trying to meet that's another number so there's a lot of numbers that you need to look at and um, balancing your food intake is um a good thing to do and often your dietitian will give you a recommended um, range for caloric intake and they'll also perhaps suggest a limit to carbohydrates so maybe it's you know 15 grams of carbs in a snack 20 grams of carbs in a meal or something like that and I'm not going to give um, a specific number of what you would be looking at because it's different for everybody and it's based on your metabolism and your body weight and your goal. So um, that's why I don't give out like a percentage for you to aim for because it's different for everybody. So you can look at counting calories, which I don't love because I think after that early stage, I'm really trying to build your um, own sensitivities to understanding what you need rather than counting and aiming for a goal. So um, 
ideally, as you progress through your journey, you would be eating when you're hungry, choosing foods that, um, you know, you need to eat that fuel your body rather than um, eating up to a number. The other thing I find with calorie counting is that <laughs> we can trade things off. So if I said to you, you need to stick to a 1400 calorie diet, um, just eat your 1400 calories a day and you'll be fine. You'll get the results you're looking for. You'd go, great, I'll have 1400 calories of fish, chicken, um, avocados and veggies and some nuts and seeds and maybe a couple of pieces of fruit. Or you could have 1,400 calories worth of biscuits, um, red wine, cheese. And see what I mean is it's still calories, but it's not nutrition. So you could look at um, counting calories, but also having a look at counting the nutrients that are going in also. So it's like the Jenny Craig program, all those point systems where they give you a certain amount of points every day. And generally people make the right choices because they're trying to be healthy and lose weight and do all that sort of stuff. However, you have those um, mindsets where we're tricky and we can get around this whole points thing where you, um, you know that a glass of wine or a cup of Coke or whatever it is is worth four points and maybe that four points could have been used for a healthy meal and they start swapping things out, um, meeting their points and looking like they're doing the right thing, but um, missing the point as far as nutrition goes. The other thing we need to be aware of is um, what happens to these calories depending on where they come from. So like I said before, refined carbs and sugars do different things in your body. They might have the same amount of calories, but they um, they do different things. So um, a calorie that comes from a fibrous, nutrient-rich piece of fruit or vegetables is um, unlikely to spike your blood glucose levels to the point where you're pumping out insulin, you know, unnecessarily, but still might have the same amount of calories. So this is how we can either get to be a little bit misled or mislead ourselves. Um, it's looking at what different foods do. In the blog this week, I've put in a link to the glycemic index, which um, I feel is helpful to understand um, different foods and their impacts on your blood glucose levels after you eat them. And the other things you can do is um, if you're eating a food that you know has a high glycemic index, you can actually slow it down a little bit by putting in protein and also a little bit of fat. And what that does is kind of dulls that insulin response that you immediately get when you start eating a high um, carbohydrate meal. So that's another reason. There's very many reasons why we tell you to eat your protein first, but that's another reason is put the protein in first and it kind of indicates to the body that not lots of insulin needs to be released here. So it calms down that system and means that your meal overall will give you a slower burn basically and less of a peak in your blood glucose levels as well. Ideally, we're trying to keep insulin off the scene because you can't burn fat when insulin's around. That's the bottom line. It's like a chemical reaction, a lock that... Um, you just can't, um, it, it's not two things that can be done together. So that was the poll. Um, please let me know in the group if you need more info on carbs and that sort of thing. The blog will explain a lot. I've put in the pros and cons of each system. If you choose to, it's personal. If you choose to count calories, it has the pros and then it has the cons. Um, and if you choose to count carbohydrates, it also has the um, pros and cons. So check it out is what I'm saying. Um, I'll have a look and see if you've got any questions in the group there. And as usual, Facebook's not showing them to me. <laughs> ah, I love Facebook. So now we'll go to the comments on um, this week's uh, poll. This one's interesting. At the moment, I'm not counting everything, just trying to get protein in. This is Kirsty. She hasn't been very well at all. And so not counting anything is probably a good thing, just trying to restore. Um, 
not eating at the moment due to all the constant medical conditions popping up. I'm waiting for an appointment with my psych to help me along as I now have a fear of food. And that really, um, when I read that this afternoon, I thought that absolutely happens when something has happened that every time you eat food, something horrible happens. It, the body sets up almost a protective mechanism as, oh, here comes food. And that's, you know, a scary thing. So I'm so pleased for you, Kirsty. And um, I'm glad we could be, you know, some support for you. It's been a terrible time. And I'm so pleased that you're making time to um, have a look at that because it, yeah, it's definitely a thing that can happen. Um, or if patients have experienced a lot of vomiting after food or something like that, often it's another thing that they have to get through is that whole um, concern of, um, you know, the continual vomiting. Um, so Dan also said, I generally try to eat mostly protein, some good fats and minimal carbs. Not a bad way to go. Try not to go over about 11 or 12 grams of sugar in a serve or ah, or I get sick. And that's your barometer. <laughs> how many carbs can I eat? Oh, that's how much. I'd be surprised if I've ever gone over 1500 calories a day since my bypass in December. I'd say about 60% of my protein comes from coffee, tea, etc. That's a concern um, because that's not necessarily providing much nutrition so yes you're getting protein but it sounds like it's from either the tasteless collagen or some kind of additive um, and if food now is still a bit meh um, and you're eight months out of surgery I'd be talking to someone about that just to see why it's not sitting well with you um, because uh, not eating food is not sustainable <laughs> Just saying. So your best interest is in um, working out why food isn't is meh, and um, finding out ways of kind of coming around from that as well. That's really important. Bernie says my husband has recently been diagnosed with type two diabetes. So whilst I knew a little bit, I have learned a bit more. If ever you have had someone in the family who's got um, insulin dependent diabetes, that's a time where. The, the educators in the hospitals and stuff will really show you through um, what is a carb, how does it work, what is a simple carb, how do they affect your blood glucose and that sort of stuff. And it's actually quite an interesting thing to know about. Um, these sorts of things also affect mood. So if you're eating a lot of really um, high glycemic foods or sugary stuff, you'll probably find your mood is a bit up and down. Your energy levels will definitely be up and down. So it gives you a nice big boost and then it just drops you off later on when the um, when your blood glucose just plummets. And then you'll be hungry, then you'll be scravy, then you'll be overeating. Um, so it's looking at um, those slow-burning meals with protein, fat, and um, some good carbs in it. Trevor says, I found calorie counting too time-consuming um, and it takes too long to do while you're busy. And I would agree with that. I, I often look at down the track... Um, not even down the track, but the portion plate and bowl will map that out for you. And generally, if you're using those kind of tools, you can't really go too far wrong. Um, and that first year after surgery is certainly a time to just get really used to eating out of the um, those portions. So you get to know exactly what um, it looks like so that even when you go out, you can imagine that you've got it in your plate or your bowl. So you're not starting to increase your portion sizes. A lot of people will talk about, um, you know, a year after surgery, oh, I can eat two cups of food um, or I can fit in much more than I used to. And it's it will happen, but it's also um, it's important to know that what you can eat and what you should eat are two different things. So making sure that your portions stay on point as well will be the key to um, continual weight loss or maintaining what you have lost. So that... Um, <laughs> That is the questions and the comments. Now um, <laughs> I'll go to share again and show you the brain fit for last Friday. Does that work? There it is. Um, each week on Fridays in the BN bariatric group, we have a little kind of riddle or a 
brain teaser. Last week, a donkey was tied up to a six-yard rope. How did it manage to eat a pile of hay 50 feet away without biting through the rope? I reckon my dog could do this. <laughs> She's like the Houdini of um, doing out-of-this-world things where you come back and you're like, I don't even know how that's happened, but something's gone on here. Um, sometimes our back deck just looks like it's been ransacked. There's like chairs, all the chairs are upside down and all the cushions are off all the furniture. Um, <laughs> I think dog ownership sometimes harder than children. So how did this donkey do that? Um, ah, the other end of the rope wasn't attached to anything. That's pretty clever. I don't know who answered that. I didn't actually see... Um, a, didn't see the, the quiz, and B, didn't see the respondents. <laughs> so maybe we were all too locked down, fatigued to um, talk about donkeys eating stuff last Friday. So moving on, this week, um, uh, the prize of the week is to do with our um, BN Shapely uh, shapewear. So we've got a range of different um shape we're arriving that uh, is comfortable for the gym comfy under your work clothes basically pretty versatile in all different um configurations so short legs boy legs um that sort of thing tummy holders all in one different um configurations we've also got a men's range too so don't feel left out boys so this week transformation tuesday um here's the second one <laughs> that was the one i did ask for so um good work that's a lovely shot and our winner is melissa parkin 14 months post-op down nearly 60 kilograms that's incredible um, 145 kilos down to 85.9, feeling the best I have in years. It's amazing to see like when people are wearing the same uniforms and that sort of stuff and just how much they've changed and everyone looks so relaxed and happy, which I like. Um, so, um, Melissa, you are the winner of our shapewear prize this week. If you send us an email to support at bnmulti.com, um, we'll, I think the girls will sort out what you're looking for and sizing and that sort of stuff as well. And who knows, you might be our next BN Shapely Shapewear model. We're always looking for people to show us and give us reviews on our new ranges. The other thing I would love to put out there is if you'd like to share your story in a podcast with me, um, we're always looking for people who have done their, you know, what gone through the process, have their own reasons for getting to needing the process, and then are happy to talk about kind of what it took for them to get to where they are now. Those sorts of stories are not only inspiring for everyone to hear, but they're also, um, they are encouraging for other people who are thinking about do I do the surgery or not? Will it change my life? What do I can I expect? So what we're trying to um, offer is a showcase of different scenarios for, you know, everyone ends up on the table for some different reason and the whole thing unfolds in a similar but very different way. So um, the more we can talk about that and what it means for people, the better. If you think you'd like to spend 40 minutes talking to me about that at some point, let me know. Um, just email support at bnmulti.com. We chat about when might be a suitable time for you and we um, send you out a good quality headset and then we just record it like we're doing now. Then we edit. And then we um, share it with our community and um, you can obviously share it with your community. So please, um, if you feel compelled to do that, you're very welcome to. And that brings me to the end of the live session. If there's questions, I'll answer them um, via my keyboard because for some reason I can never get access to them while I'm talking. Um, so please, Australia, take good care of yourselves and your loved ones and stay safe and have a lovely week.